All right. Hey, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming. My name is Jonathan Ringdahl. I'm looking forward to sharing some tips and tricks on making better adventure pictures. Photography is a big passion of mine, so I'm, I'm really excited and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, providing you with some great information as well as answering questions you have. If you have questions, put them in the chat. And then at the end of the program, we will get to those questions and I will be sharing my contact information too for follow-up conversations if there's more things you wanna talk about or you want to know. So with that, we'll move on to the next slide. All right, um, and this is one of those hot button issues at times for people and because I want you to feel comfortable, we're gonna talk. We'll just get editing um, out of the way right away. Uh, I always shoot in raw and this gives me the most possible control. If you're unfamiliar with what raw is, it is the uh, image coming right off of your camera's sensor. All cameras have sensors from phones to drones to your SLRs to your mirrorless cameras. Those all have sensors in them. You know, your, your more um, standard digital cameras and that is why I say let's go with raw and then you have that creative freedom when it comes to editing if that's something that you want to do. If you don't want to play around with editing programs then you could just shoot in JPEG and one of the things that you should know is that when you get a new camera, most of the time, the image quality setting isn't set to the highest possible settings. So you wanna go into those menus and look at those and change your settings so that you are getting the highest quality picture coming out of the camera. And that is why I choose RAW because if you shoot in JPEG, your camera makes the editing decisions for you. So uh, I've had people go, well, you know, you, you shoot in raw, you do the editing, that's not the real photo. Yes, it still is. If your goal is to make your photo look like what you saw. And you can go beyond that a little bit too, to get creative with your, photography so it's just it's a personal decision that that you have to make and jpeg is fine if that's what you want and you're happy with it that's awesome if you want to shoot in raw and you want to make those editing decisions that's awesome too uh, and if you're looking at doing that if you're looking at raw and editing and you're a contest photographer just make sure you're aware of those rules before you dive into it all right, and uh, then I get this question a lot as well. Uh, what is the best camera? And it is simple, like you see on the screen, it's the one you have with you. And I feel like everybody on here that has been doing photography for a while would sympathize with, I didn't bring my camera with, and then I saw XYZ amazing. I saw a grizzly bear, I saw an eagle going after a fish. So it's very important have your camera with you, whatever it is, whether it's your, your phone, uh, standard digital camera, your SLR, your mirrorless, your GoPro, have it with you and know how to use it. Because if you know basic techniques and how to use your camera, you can get amazing pictures. And then of course there's, there's variations. Uh, they say a cell phone camera isn't going to zoom in on a bald eagle catching a fish. Um, and, or, you know, it's not gonna show you that bear up close and personal, like a telephoto lens will that can zoom in on it and uh, don't approach the wildlife to get a closer picture. Or um, I was on Isle Royal backpacking and one guy showed me a picture. He was like, I was down in the creek at Washington Creek and uh, take a look, man. This bull moose came in the creek and I took a selfie with it. Uh, and I was like, man, I'm like, 
Uh, so if there's one thing I can share with you about photography as well is don't do anything that makes you a headline. Okay. It's a little side tangent there. Uh, and um, when uh, you're looking at getting a camera, the biggest question is to ask is, you know, what do you want to use it for? Are you going out there to capture these broad vistas, these landscapes, or are you looking for, for wildlife? Let's say if I'm going to look at a landscape, I'm going to want a wider lens that's going to show me more of it. If I'm looking for wildlife, one of the first lenses that I would look to purchase then would be a zoom lens. My first one was a 70 to 300 millimeter lens for zooming in. If you're looking at a higher end digital camera, how far does it zoom? Uh, you know, if you're looking for paddle sports, I do a ton of kayaking. I have an Olympus TG4 and a GoPro for those because those are waterproof. Uh, if you're looking at backpacking, mirrorless cameras are bringing the weight down exponentially on cameras. So that might be something you're looking for. Or if you're looking to backpack and just want landscapes. Hey, it looks like uh, the Zoom call dropped. No, no, and the only participant in there is is me. Um, maybe go back to the uh, the Zoom meeting invite and click the link to join again. And we'll just kind of pick up where we left off. All right. Yeah. Bye. All right, you are the host now. Okay, cool. Uh, do you remember the last slide you saw? Uh, it was the. Um, here, maybe it's the same. Uh, which, which, what is the best camera? Okay, that's the one. Thank you. Yep. So I'll right. put you in full screen and go ahead and share your screen and. All right. 
There we go. Okay. Okay, there we go. Cool. All right. Um, sorry about that, folks. Technology, technology happens. Let me go back to that. Um, so anyways, uh, might have to rehash some information because I'm not sure where exactly the, the chat dropped. Never had that in person where all of a sudden I freeze. So uh, thanks for bearing with, with the, the technology here, which we're talking about technology here with cameras and everything. So um, yeah, just make sure um, have that camera with you, bring it with you. It doesn't do you any good if it's not with you. And I can assure you the coolest thing you'll ever see will happen when your camera is not with you according to Murphy's law. And it's more important that with whatever camera you have, that you learn good techniques and how to use it. You can get amazing pictures on almost any camera if you know how to use it right and have some good techniques in your toolkit. Uh, and when you're looking at getting a camera, if you're looking at getting a camera that has lenses, say if you're interested in landscapes, wide angle lenses are the way to go. And when I'm referencing wide angle lenses, I might be talking about a 10 millimeter, a 14 millimeter lens that's gonna let you see most of what's in front of you. If you're looking for wildlife, if you're looking at getting say um, a, a high end digital camera, how far out does it, does it zoom? If you're looking at a camera system with interchangeable lenses. Uh, my first uh, zoom lens was uh, 70 to 300. If you're looking at paddle sports, then waterproof is important. I love the Olympus series. I have a TG4, I have a GoPro. Uh, if you're looking at going backpacking, then weight is a consideration. <laughs> I carried uh, 200 to 500 lens across Isle Royal for 46 miles this summer. I'm kind of crazy. Uh, it was, I carried it on a chest harness. So it was because um, I wanted to have it ready. I did get an amazing bull moose picture on it. So it was worth it for me to carry that. You have to make your choices of, I want something nice that's going to get me some landscapes while I'm backpacking. I don't necessarily need a zoom function. You'll save yourself a lot of weight that way. So again, just depends on what you're looking at. It's important to go out there, uh, read reviews and see. I love Ken Rockwell. That's my go-to source for learning about camera equipment. Uh, and then also asking friends who know about cameras or people you trust. Uh, I'll have my contact information at the end. You're certainly welcome to reach out to me and ask me questions about what camera should I get? I'm looking at going this way, that way, and I can help point you in the right direction. All right. Uh, and then I firmly believe this. Great pictures are not accidents. Some people go, wow, you know, I got this, this amazing picture by accident. And I go, that's awesome. I'm happy for you. However, if you had taken some time to look at it, I don't say this to people while I'm out there. I, I, they're, if they're excited, I'm excited and happy for them. Uh, but I believe that if you get in and you're deliberate and you're planning this out, that you are going to be able to increase the quality of your pictures. And this certainly takes patience and time and it's failing your way to success. If you keep getting pictures and you're, you're analyzing them, you're like, this isn't quite what I want. And then that will help you continue to improve and getting to where you want to be. So that's what I that's what I do is just keep getting out there. Um, you'll see some pictures in here that I thought about taking out because my skills have improved since I've made this presentation. I've included some newer photos too, but I will tell you why that I was thinking of taking some of these out so that you can learn from, from what I've done in my picture taking. So, and um, when, uh, you are out there at an overlook. I feel like most of us have seen someone just walk up, put their camera up, take a picture and keep on walking. 
versus taking that time to stop, to look you know, up, down, all around, see what's around them. And yeah, it's great to get a whole picture of the whole scene. Some of those scenes are absolutely stunning, but then there's also pictures within that picture that you can, you can narrow down and uh, emphasize certain parts of the landscape to send different messages. So that's really cool and really fun once you, you understand how to do that. And you'll see things that other people don't see. I was taking pictures of mallards this morning because somebody said they wanted a mallard picture. And I just had to wait till the clouds moved until I got the light that I was looking for. So I just hung out and I waited, the clouds moved, and then I got that, that beautiful green that's on the mallard heads. And that's a picture that someone will then want to have. Um, so yeah, just thinking, thinking about those things as you're working, you're setting it up that how can I make the picture that I want here? And um, one thing I've been guilty of this, and that's why I actually just added this today is do not pass something to come back later. Maybe you end up taking a different route or you see something and it looks amazing while well, the sun is always moving and then you come back and you're going, that doesn't look that good now. So if you see something that looks amazing, take the picture then. Uh, and I mean, as photographers, if you really want to set yourself apart, be out there in nasty weather. I love getting out in the rain to take pictures. It changes the mood, it changes the lighting. It can really add a sense of drama to a picture. However, we also must remember that we are dealing with electronics. So you can, you know, bring an umbrella with you. Um, you know, you, you can, if you have a friend that's willing to hold that umbrella, um, that, that's awesome too, you know, bring them, bring them along. Um, I've actually put rain axe on the front of my GoPro's lens before so that water drips off of it. Um, I'm a big fan of having something that will make your camera float because I have dropped cameras in the water before and the float has, has saved me. It hasn't happened often, but when it does, I'm thankful for that, that float. Um, there's, there's waterproof bags and cases as well that you can get for cameras. The cases can get a little expensive when we're talking about SLRs, but they're out there. Um, there's camera covers as well. I'm pretty sure that I put a picture in here of one of them that I got to go backpacking on Isle Royal because it's pretty lightweight. Yep, there's that camera cover that you can see right there. So essentially this one is just a piece of plastic. It has a cinch cord on the end where it's up there by the lens hood. And this one actually had a hole where I could look through for my viewfinder. I could reach my hand up inside of it to be able to get the, the controls. Um, I could get both hands up there if I wanted to. Uh, however, this is this is 2020. I had to selfie this picture because nobody else was there. So that's just the uh, one of the nice things though about all the different options out there for camera equipment that can help you protect your camera and be out in the rain. Um, here, this is, uh, I used to have the Nikon AW100, that's what I took this picture with. Uh, but anyways, it's, it's a waterproof camera. So, you know, it's like get there, uh, get it wet because some of these pictures that we took underwater are some of our favorite pictures from this trip to the Apostle Islands. GoPros can do this too. Uh, and then what's really cool when you have a waterproof camera or a GoPro is I had part of the camera all the way down in the water when I took this picture. So it gives it that really neat effect of just being right on the water surface. And that to me is amazing. Uh, and it is important, like I said, that's that, you know, GoPros have the floats. Um, that one, I just picked up at a garage sale and I wrapped it around the camera strap and away went with it. Uh, carabiners, the little black circle there is a tether that I attach to my kayak in addition to the GoPro mount because I like to have redundancy with my equipment. 
Uh, here you can see, I like these shoulder slings more than the neck slings, especially when you're talking about if you're gonna be having your camera on you all day long. Um, and I actually originally got this before I went to India because I did not want to be advertising my camera as much. And so the shoulder sling also kept it a little more, a little more discreet, allowed me to be a little more stealthy as I was walking around, especially with, with street pictures and this and that. I didn't have this lens at the time because there's nothing discreet or stealthy uh, about this lens. And um, I do not carry the camera with the strap when I have that lens attached because of how heavy it is, it would be, I don't want to put that much weight on the threads where the lens goes into the camera. So that's an important consideration to make so that you don't break your camera. So, and here's a little closer picture of how I actually attach it because good judgment comes from bad judgment. And please let my bad judgment be your good judgment. I used to only use the tripod mount on the bottom to screw in this strap. Well, I had on my 14 to 24 2.8 lens that Nikon makes. For those that know about that lens, it's a very expensive lens. And that bottom tether came loose and the camera fell with that lens on it. Um, the lens didn't get too badly damaged, thankfully, but it was still a painful lesson. And one of the kids that I used to work with actually made this and it's meant to hold keys. However, I purposed it to be redundancy to keep my camera from falling off. Um, I have a picture of the chest harness that I used on Isle Royale National Park coming up and that has tethers on it as well, but they're a little bit longer than what I liked because the, all the bouncing from backpacking eventually would cause the socket that went into the bottom of the tripod collar on that lens would come loose and then the lens would, in the camera, would, would fall a little bit and would jerk. Uh, it, it wasn't the most fun thing to have happen. And I got in the habit quickly of uh, periodically tightening it up. And, uh, and I bring a screwdriver with me whenever I'm going out to do photography work so I can make sure my tripod collars and anything that's going in those sockets stays nice and tight because there will come times when your lens is too heavy and or you're trying to um, turn your camera on its side on the tripod and it, and it wiggles loose, the tighter you can get it with a screwdriver, the better off you're gonna be, friends. I don't want anyone else's camera falling down with an expensive lens on it. Um, here's, here's the harness that I was talking about. I, I really do like this. Uh, I, think it's, I think these are great. These chest harnesses really help distribute the weight from those lenses, allow you to uh, lock it in and carry it for longer distances and be more comfortable as well as having it right there and ready because you just never know when you're gonna have some wildlife encounter that you wanna take a picture of. You don't wanna be digging in your bag for your camera at that time. So it's just a, about being ready to go and just being aware that as you're hiking and moving that those base plates at the bottom can come loose. So having some kind of tether, either using the one that comes on your chest harness or um, coming up with your own is something that will save you uh, potentially a lot of money in protecting your camera. Okay, so um, some of you may have heard of the rule of thirds, which is just simply of placing your subject or interesting parts where thirds of the frame intersect. So here's a picture of Pictured Rock Cave at Wailusing State Park. And it was actually really hard to get down to this spot. So this little side tangent here, 
it, it carry ice cleats with you is what I would recommend. Carry all kinds of equipment with you that you think you might need on a photo assignment. But then you'll see here, I add in these grid lines here. So you can see that I ran the frozen waterfall there on the left side of the frame down that line there where those lines connect in that upper left quadrant there line up on the on the waterfall so this is kind of a visual example of the rule of thirds and once you understand it and you do it for a while then you might start venturing off from it once you're learning more about about composition however i feel like it's a good place to start practicing doing that uh, and um, when we're looking at making things pop in a photograph, trying to create interest, if you think about the color wheel and trying to find colors that are on the, the opposite side of it, you're increasing contrast, you're going to draw more attention to certain areas of the photograph. So you can see here, you've got these red bunch berries mixed in here around the this moose antler and I did move this moose antler into this patch of bunch berries because I thought I'm like wow this would be really interesting really cool if I put this moose antler in here and so uh, like I said because Bullwinkle wasn't kind enough to just be like you know what Jonathan's gonna come to Isle Royal this summer and I should put this here. I should drop this antler here for him to get a really cool picture. Um, it doesn't always work out like that. Um, but anyways, I just do love the red and the green pairing in this picture. And it also reminded me that sometimes it's better just to keep things simple. If, if you've seen a picture of a subway station full of people, you're going, what am I looking at here? I just get lost in this picture. So it's one another, just a, another tip. Um, and then there's all kinds of lines out in the world too. And then we can use those lines to direct our viewers to look at something. And it's, it's just one of those things of taking your time to look at a scene because lines can either help you or they can distract from what you're trying to show in your picture. And, you know, you can talk about too, um, people can also help you direct attention to where you want things to look at. Like if somebody's looking at something that people can see in the picture, they're gonna follow that person's gaze towards what they're looking at. Or say, if you take a picture of someone that is looking off of the frame, that is where people's eyes are going to go when you're taking pictures as well. And the simple test is just looking at that picture after you take it or before you take it and going, where am I going? Where do my eyes go in this, this landscape? So um, the best thing to do is just keep getting out and practicing this and looking at your pictures after the fact. Uh, so here you can see we've got the red kayak here and the kayak is pointing out into the lake and out at those sailboats. And Sarah, though, has her head turning to the left. So she's actually looking out off of the picture frame. So things, it was a spontaneous picture. I was more new into photography at this time. And I didn't have that idea, that concept of it. Otherwise, I might have said, hey, Sarah, turn your head a little bit more, straighten, straighten it up a little bit to make it look a little bit more interesting, uh, keep viewers' eyes running down towards the sailboats. All right, so uh, here's another one. Uh, I used the boat here in Bayfield. There are the lines on the boat that direct you to look up and into Bayfield. Uh, the ferry might take your eye a little bit off to the left side. It's different for, for everybody. Uh, if I were to take this picture again, I would probably take out 
some of that sky just because I feel your eyes get lost up there. There's not really a lot of clouds that add anything to this picture. So I just want to leave it in as an, as an example of things that I see now that I did not necessarily see before, which is part of the fun of this whole photography journey and process is, is always learning, always growing. And you never know who is going to come in and give you some good information. I stopped randomly at a gallery and was talking to the gallery owner and showing him some pictures. And he was telling me things that he saw in my pictures that I didn't see. So it's pretty cool to have those kinds of conversations with people that know a little bit more about photography than you do. Um, uh, and an, another easy way to set your photography apart and add interest is if you're getting down low or you're getting up higher than what you see other people doing, tilting your camera in different angles, uh, you know, getting, getting in the water. Uh, I met one of the best photographers I've ever met this year on Isle Royal, and he came out of the water and I was like whoa like this guy uh you know expensive camera expensive lens I'm like Ben you're intense man and yet his pictures of moose that he got when we were out there are incredible uh and he was doing it safely he was keeping his distance from the moose and using a uh, good lens to get close up close up pictures but he was just going to the next level to get these amazing pictures he was going above and beyond what other people were doing to get pictures and he was getting so much better pictures as a result and that was a transformational experience for me so like getting in the water getting dirty changing your perspective however you can like using terrain ladders buildings and cars to get higher if you're not thrilled about getting on the ground and getting dirty just bring a mat with you sleeping mat yoga mat etc to to get down on the ground um, funny story my dad uh, let me drive his truck and then he came back and he was like why are there dents in the roof of my truck and I'm like, dad, I saw this eagle nest and I wanted to get a higher vantage point. And he just, he, sh he shook his head. He loves me. So he still let me take the truck. But anyways, <laughs> funny story there. Just got to do what you got to do. Uh, so I, I was physically laying on the ground to get as close to eye level as I could with this little caterpillar. It was awesome. I love this picture. Um, same thing. I probably, I think I went down to, uh, a knee to get this monarch butterfly. And uh, then I entered it in the photography contest at Rochakri State Park. And it took second place in the animals category. So that was really cool. Um, at Buckhorn State Park, I remember I was laying on the ground because this dragonfly was on this stick right over the grass. And love it i love this picture this would not have looked nearly as cool if i was standing up um, and then uh, the many glacier hotel here glacier national park if i had taken this picture from right down in front of the hotel you would not have had anywhere near the same view of the mountains however there's a little knoll that goes up from it towards where the parking lot is and just changing that perspective gives you so much more of a view of those mountains. So just by being observant and looking around and also talking to people, if you talk to other photographers, you talk to other people, they'll give you tips and tricks on where to go in certain places. Um, like I said, it's, uh, you know, it's just really about if you're looking to make these photographs happen and get these amazing pictures, that your friends on Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat are going, whoa, I, I can't believe you got that picture. Um, you know, it's really, you just have to go and people will not go, go places people will not go. I mean, get into these places, just do it safely. That's the biggest thing. And also be considerate of 
the potential ecological impact. Uh, big leave no trace guy, very strict ethics when it comes to photography. I'm not gonna trample on sensitive landscapes, endangered plants, et cetera, et cetera. Very, be very conscious of, of your impact. Um, there's some places I take pictures of that I keep to myself. I just, I don't share it, I don't post them because those areas are sensitive places and I do not want to encourage people to go in those places because in this Instagram generation, unfortunately some places have been ruined by too many people coming there and then they have to, they have to shut them down or I've heard of bridges having to get torn down because people want to have an Instagram picture. So uh, just be conscious of where you're going and don't hurt the environment just so you can get 10 more Instagram followers. That's, that's my view towards photography as well as also respecting those distances for wildlife. Because, you know, say like uh, the old expression, a fed bear is a dead bear. So be, be conscious of that. Um, yeah, that's that. Um, waterfalls, I love getting out and, uh, and chasing waterfalls. Uh, when it's cloudy days, I'm all about, let's go find some waterfalls. Uh, neutral density filters, for those not familiar, those are like putting sunglasses on your camera. They will darken it down and neutral density filters and all filters go on camera lenses that have threats is what it is. So that's usually your digital SLRs, your mirrorless cameras. Even if you don't have threads on your camera, I did it when I got my first neutral density filter and I just held it in front of my lens without touching the camera. And that's how I worked my way around not having threads, but still wanting to use it. And you'll see some examples of the effect that neutral density filters have coming up. And uh, another tip is all of my lenses have UV filters on them. They are clear filters. I make sure that I buy high quality filters so that they are as clear as can be so that they show no effect on my images. And what that does is if that something hits the front of the lens, your neutral, not your neutral density, but um, your UV filter will break instead of your lens. So it's better to break a $70 filter than a $1,400 lens. So just something to think about there. Um, and the reason why cloudy days are best is when you have sunshine and you have all these bright areas, that's going to ruin your image. And um, one of the things that I learned this year is you don't need to capture the whole waterfall to make it a cool picture. You can focus on parts of the waterfall. I will have a, a picture of a waterfall at Lake Redstone by Wisconsin Dells, Wisconsin. And the top of that waterfall is concrete walls. However, the picture I have doesn't show those because I focused on part of the waterfall. So um, this is Comet Falls in Mount Rainier National Park. This is one of the worst days that I've ever taken pictures on. Uh, it's the Pacific Northwest. It was raining this day. Um, I used my, I wanted to keep my raincoat on, but I wanted to have something to cover my camera because I didn't have a cover at the time. I didn't have an umbrella. So I used my ghost whisperer that I bought at Midwest Mountaineering uh, down jacket to cover and protect my camera from the rain and all the moisture in the air. So I had to set up on a tripod. Pod. I used a self timer and um, I held the camera strap so that it wouldn't fall into the creek. And it's one of my favorite waterfall pictures that I've ever taken. And I didn't need to use a neutral density filter today, which would have helped on a brighter day to make that dreamy effect in the water. And by long exposure, I'm talking it could be, you know, one second to 10 seconds. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Um, I'm happy with 
um, phones because more phones are offering the ability to change settings to make things like this happen. Uh, they'll never, in my opinion, match what you can get out of digital SLRs and mirrorless for flexibility, but they're, they're, they're coming along. Um, and, you know, here's kind of what I was talking about. This is Avalanche Gorge in Glacier National Park. It's an amazing spot. However, when we were there, the sun was shining. On that left side, you can see that, that bright area. And when you get blowouts like that, editing programs, even in RAW, have a very hard time recovering any detail out of there and making that look good. That's why it's good to go on those, those cloudy days. Um, and yeah, and just in general in photography, your eye is going to go to bright areas. You can use that to bring emphasis to something or to, you know, it can, yeah, just that's, that's it. it can draw, it can draw emphasis. So even if you have someone wear bright colors, if that's what you want people to notice, go for it. Um, but anyways, here's that waterfall. So I just showed, I just picked a part of that waterfall that I really liked. I liked how the stones on the right and the left framed up the waterfall. And that's what I took a picture of. So you would have no idea that up above there's, there's some concrete walls on either side. You just see this majestic waterfall. So that's, that was, that was a really cool trip. Cool trick that I learned. Um, uh, nighttime pictures. There's a lot of similarities to, to waterfall pictures um, using a tripod. Uh, I learned how to improvise in Paris. I'll show you that picture. Um, another one of the things, like I said, that, that emphasized part of the waterfall. I also learned this year from um, Brian Hansel. Some of you may know him up by Grand Marais. I took a workshop with him. Um, remove the center column because it'll make your camera on your tripod more stable. Uh, right now I use a self timer, but there's remote shutters. Just be careful not to touch the camera. If it's windy, block the wind with your body or you know, if you've got a raincoat or some other coat, you know, flap it out. Just try and block the wind as much as you can so it doesn't shake the camera because that'll cause blur when you're doing long exposures. Uh, you can use a headlight, headlamp, headlight, <laughs> flashlight or headlamp to draw on your pictures when you're doing long exposure pictures. That's really fun to play with. Um, loosely hold that camera strap if you're worried about the camera falling. Um, if it's not somewhere I'm worried about it falling and it's windy, I will take it off because even that camera strap blowing in the wind can make your picture blurry. Uh, one of the challenges with say waterfalls when you're using a neutral density filter and nighttime pictures is focus. That's why if you see uh, basically what looks like a sideways H, that's the infinity symbol. Uh, that's a good way to go for, for nighttime photography, unless you are able to light up what you're trying to take a picture of with your flashlight, headlamp, car headlights to let the camera focus. Otherwise you are going to have to use manual focus. Uh, so like, let's say you're doing a waterfall and you're going to put a neutral density filter on, uh, switch to manual focus, focus it, add the filter, and then go from there. And again, um, there's a bunch of information here. So, and I do urge you to contact me if you really are interested and you want to dive in deeper and know more. I'm very happy to take the time. And we all know how to talk over Zoom now. So I'd even be take the time to do that for you. So I want you to get really good pictures. Um, here's, um, this is uh, Heaven's Peak there is near those lit up clouds. This is from Granite Park Chalet. Uh, I said, beware of bears unless you like bear hugs. Not a fan of that kind of bear hug. Uh, I was up on the second story balcony to take this picture and I was being very mindful. I was like, well, you know, a bear could walk up those stairs. Uh, thankfully that didn't happen. But anyways, uh, but beautiful. Uh, I love being out there in the Milky Way. 
uh, and uh, here's the Eiffel Tower in Paris. I did actually have to use a bench to take this picture because I didn't have my tripod properly secured when I was going through the airport in Paris and it fell and the head broke off. So I was in one of the most beautiful cities in the world without a tripod. So um, yeah, secure your gear and also look to be creative. I mean, I even stacked up books at one point to take a picture. Um, and here, these are two examples of light painting. I used my headlamp to light up that lighthouse to, so you, it gives it more foreground context versus just straight up Northern Lights. Amazing, love the Northern Lights. However, it just, it tells, it adds to the story when the lighthouse is there. Um, and this is over at uh, Kinstone. It's over here um, along the Mississippi River in Wisconsin. And that's Comet Neowise from this summer. And again, same thing here. I used my headlamp to light that stone up because otherwise the stone would have been black just to give it that sense of place. A lot of fun to play around with. Um, said I mentioned about cameras not focusing. Um, same thing, if you're shooting in a cave, shine the light where you want the camera to focus. And then that, then bam. So like here's uh, my friend Sarah uh, in a cave here. And um, I probably used either my headlamp to focus on her or I set the focus point to be on her headlamp. And that let the camera focus. And I also used flash to light her up. So here's some light drawing from the same place that I took that Milky Way picture and just GNP for Glacier National Park. Might take you a few tries, but eventually you keep practicing, you'll get the hang of it and it's a lot of fun. Uh, if you're trying to capture motion, use burst mode if you have it on your camera and fast shutter speeds to freeze that action. So here's a picture of a a bald eagle. Uh, birds can be difficult to photograph, to put it mildly at times. So they're always moving, they're always flying. Uh, if in a perfect world, the eagle would be on the left side of the picture. So its gaze is leading you into the frame instead of off of the frame. That's just, that's something to shoot for with, with pictures, with animals and people is have them looking into the frame, generally speaking, is what I'm going for. Um, so just some, some quickness. Okay, we're talking about, you know, if you're trying to get your pictures to look bright, be good. Fast shutter speeds mean you're getting in less light. And if you shoot in auto, these things are not, you know, the, the camera usually does these, these settings for you. However, even if you are a cell phone shooter, you're using your digital camera. If you see those different modes on there, like you see A, M, S, I uh, encourage you to figure those out because it gives you more control over the pictures. And there's nothing wrong whatsoever at, at using auto. But if you're looking to push your skills, which is why I hope you're here, then uh, I encourage you to to venture beyond. And if you're not sure where to start, take my contact information, please do reach, reach out to me. I sincerely mean that, that I wanna help you get better at, at taking pictures. Um, so yeah, and you know, the, like when we're talking about, we're slowing down our shutter speed, which is what we're going to want to do for night pictures, waterfall pictures. So say that Eagle, we were shooting one eight hundredth of a second, when we're looking at the night sky, maybe we're doing five seconds, 15 seconds to let in the light that's necessary. Uh, and, and if people are involved though, and people are moving when you're doing a five second exposure, they're gonna look ghostly. If you're going for that, it can look really cool. If you're trying to actually get the people to look good, that's not what you want. Um, apertures, at first to me, this was confusing. This seemed backwards. Uh, a higher number aperture let in less light, but brings more in focus. So if you're shooting at 
uh, F16, you got a bright sunny day, maybe partly cloudy, your landscape's gonna look great. Um, lower number means you're bringing in more light, less at focus. So like, let's say 2.8, great for night sky because you're gonna let in more light and it's gonna be great. You're not really concerned with showing a lot of depth like a landscape. Uh, you may see ISO function, it increases your cameras, your sensors sensitivity to light, which a higher number is gonna make your camera, your pictures brighter, but then they might look grainy and nasty, especially if you're talking about uh, normal digital cameras or even crop sensor digital SLRs, it's gonna be tough. Uh, lower numbers, pictures darker, more clarity. I can provide you some good resources to help you understand that better if you're interested. Um, so it takes patience to really make that shot that you want to get. And I would rather take my time to get a few good pictures than just sit there and, and click away, click away, click away and have 50 pictures that to me don't look that good. Um, said so it's important, you know, if you're trying to get a cool picture of an animal, take some time to watch it or, you know, wait for the light or clouds to be where you want, like I did this morning with mallards. Um, and anticipation helps. So if you're thinking like, how is this animal going to interact with its landscape? What is it going to do? And then be ready if it's going to do that. And that's what I did here with this goose. It's like, you know what? I think that goose is going to jump on that log. The goose did, and I got it with its wings open. So I was really happy that actually the plan came together. Um, natural frames are awesome. Here's the Apostle Island sea caves. That's so cool. I love that. Um, and then it's important. One of the things I've learned is really to take your time, look high and low, look at what the shadows are doing, looking up, down, and all around, and just being intentional uh, and sometimes it helps to either you know you're going by yourself or you're going with someone else who's into photography because otherwise you're going to drive all the rest of your hiking friends crazy uh, so here's one um, this took first place in the plants category in a contest at Rocha Creek State Park so it was just a sunrise morning same morning I took that monarch picture noticed it thought it was cool took a picture of it um, pa uh, Pac-Man mushroom, I like to call it, and trying to walk a walk us. It's fun, but another just being observant, um, you know. And and then, uh, like I said, having that camera ready to go. Right now, my camera, because it's cold, lives in my trunk, so that if I'm going outside, I'm not getting condensation in the camera, which is bad. And then it's not going to fog up because it's already acclimated to the temperature outside so I'm, I'm ready to go uh, let's say when I'm on backpacking trips my camera with my zoom lens is always ready so on the highline trail I got these two marmots wrestling if I had to dig in my pack for my camera they would have been gone um, you know and then you can put people in to add some elements other elements to it too moving them around um, they, they're good for giving a, a sense of scale and you can see here, here's my friend Marky. She's closer to the camera here. And then now she's out farther and she looks significantly smaller. So, you know, it makes the landscape look bigger when she's that small. Um, golden hours, you know, it's that hour before, you know, or I should say the hour after sunrise and then the hour before sunset is when you want to be out there, you get this amazing color, alpine glow in the mountains. Uh, it's just really good, you know, especially when you're talking sunrise and sunset, is just be there and be ready before that time comes so that you can take advantage of it, especially when you're talking about when you're traveling and you have limited time. Uh, you can see the alpine glow here at Glacier National Park on Heaven's Peak. Love that. Um, said research, research, research when you're looking for places to go. 
if you come across someone who's been somewhere you want to go, ask them questions. Photography books are good. I even found some at my library when I was going to go out to Glacier. Uh, there's so many resources on the internet, social media. Uh, you know, there's like I said, out by Glacier National Park, there's camera stores. You can give them a call. Um, I've found some of the best places by actually talking to people that work in parks too. And especially when I would talk to people this year at parks because things were kind of slow at times, um, they were really happy to talk. And um, I use the app Photo Pills, which really helps me in, in planning. It has augmented reality and you can see where the sun is gonna be moving across the sky, the moon, the planning functions in that app are amazing. I think it's about $8. However, it was really a good investment. Um, yeah. Um, and like I said, you know, if we're looking to keep getting better at taking pictures, um, raise your standards, really. Only post your, your best pictures out there and then have that challenge to yourself and that'll help you uh, you get better, you know, evaluate the pictures you take and other people take. And if you see something you really like, figure out why you like that picture. Um, like I said, I went to a photography workshop with Brian Hansel up in Grand Marais back in February. That was awesome. It's like, I'd never done that. And I learned a lot. And then just being out there and asking questions, uh, get out there and take pictures. The more you take pictures, the more experience you build, the more you'll find out what works and what you like, and then your pictures will get better. Um, so I, I mentioned that earlier, go with other photographers. That helps a lot. Um, leave no trace, mention that. Um, get out there and have fun. Um, you can see there's the black cap chickadee on my head. Sorry, I'm from Wisconsin, if you don't like the Packer logo. <laughs> um, said, just have fun, find shots around. I pulled around, Parked the kayaks, got the right angles, so alert the fish was eating the kayak. I believe in having fun in life and with photography. Um, they said, never give up. Eventually, you'll find a good shot, or it will find you. In the case of this, uh, this little downy woodpecker here hanging out, seeing what I'm doing. Um, here's my my contact information, and so you can um, reach out to me that way. I'll leave this up for just a minute um, so that you can reach me a bunch of different ways. I believe my contact information is on the website. I'm trying to wrap this up so I can get to questions too because we had that little technological blip there. So I want to answer questions too. So if you need things, I'm, I'm sure we can you can find a way, you know, if you reach out to, to a Don or you check on the, the event page, I'm sure we can get you my information. All right. So I'm going to jump back over here. Stop sharing. Well, let's see. Okay. Let's see if I can see if I can get it up here. Okay. All right. Do you still have me, Adon? Do. Okay. Um, I don't see questions in the chat though. Uh, correct. There was just a couple comments. Um, there was someone mentioning to okay. avoid old old school skylight and UV filters. They mess up with they mess up digital sensors. White and color balance has changed because of that. They suggest using a modern day clear glass filter. Um, such as this uh, B plus W clear, et cetera, et cetera, filter. Um, I'm familiar with B plus W, yep, yep. the best filters in the world. <laughs> and some, also some of the most expensive. <laughs> um, yeah, they are, they are pricey. I have, I have some of those and I use, I yeah. use some of those. I'm definitely a fan of, yeah, making sure they're, they are uh, very clear. Yeah. When I was at a camera store, they actually put a quarter underneath a higher quality glass filter and a lower quality filter and also cost one was you know more than the other yeah and, and to me then that's how it showed me of wow investing in quality filters does produce better pictures right right i mean there is there is something to be said for um um 
Oh, here's a question. Do you have any tips for freshly fallen snow photographs? Ooh, freshly fallen snow photographs. Man, yeah, we're getting we're getting there. I love it. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would think fresh... overexposure would be something difficult to control. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It can be it can be very bright. Um, yeah, um, you know, and and just before this started, Don shared with me his photo background, so he might be even more qualified than I am to talk about this. But uh, so. Uh, for people that are up around in Midwest mountaineering, I'm over here in Wisconsin, you know, you can um, <laughs> harass the Don about cameras. Dude. You'd actually... Yeah, feel free. So, I'm here Wednesday through Sundays. <laughs> yeah, Wednesday through Sunday. So, yeah, yeah. Stay six feet away and wear a mask, please. Take yeah. your temperature. You know, we're, uh, anyways. Um, yeah, yeah, that, um, yeah, freshly fallen snow. Snow can be very bright. That's for sure. Yeah. So yeah, watching out, like Adon said, for you know, getting it blowing out way, way too bright. Um, I but I do love, I do love snow because, yeah, that you can get great contrast with the trees that are around there with all the leaves falling off. It adds a different dynamic. Um, having people, if you're in, incorporating people into your pictures. And then what doesn't stand out against white? I mean, anything you put in colors, like probably my favorite is red. So, you know, I put in people in red and they're just out there in the, they're doing things in the snow. It's just like, boom, it just, it, it pops. So yeah, introducing color into your snow scenes is awesome. It can put, it puts more emphasis on trees as you're going. Um, I looking for looking for evergreen trees covered in snow. That's those are the places that I love to go when you're talking freshly falling snow. Um, yeah, I think yeah. Um, you know it. The sort of you know if you're thinking of freshly fallen snow, there's a couple of ways to think about it. Like, is it falling currently, or has it has yeah. it fallen? And and we're looking at two different scenarios here. If it's currently falling and you want to get out and take some photos. I would encourage people to probably ditch the autofocus and go to manual because then, you know, that snow is falling in a three-dimensional space and it's okay if you get some of the foreground um, out of focus, you're going to get some of that snow in focus. So play around with that. Try to choose a shorter focal, focusing distance or even a further one to try to create space and depth within the photo because um, those snowflakes are, you know, um, hopefully big and fluffy, but sometimes they're not. Um, I would yeah, think yeah, I would yeah. also add that, you know, thinking about the speed at which the snow is falling, like playing around with shutter. If it's slowly falling to the ground, floating to the ground, you can make that look like it's falling faster with, with you know, holding the shutter open a bit longer and, and stopping down your aperture or, or freezing it, kind of more of an action shot, you know? Um, so there's, there's different ways to kind of manipulate it and then tell your own version of that, that's, that scene. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, those are awesome. Those are awesome points. I love the exchange with other photographers because I'm like picking up some things. I'm like, yeah, that's those are really good points that I didn't think of. So, yeah, yeah, thanks, Adon. I'm becoming a better photographer too. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, there's a question here that came up. Um, do you have any favorite back roads in the SNS Superior National Forest? I would assume that's what that means. Any favorite back roads? Um, I don't know that Superior national forest up there i it's yeah um yeah i am sure it's amazing a uh, place to be anywhere up there is awesome it's just not an area that i'm familiar with so unfortunately i can't be your your guide for that one <laughs> all right um i don't see any other questions coming in um we got another presentation here about 10 minutes. So why don't we go ahead and sign off? Thanks yep. again for your time and your collaboration and, and your sharing your skill set and your passion with us. I think it's um, I find it always very beneficial to to me uh, to be able to learn what other people's passions are and how they how they share them. So thank you again for that. Um, really appreciate you. Yeah, you're welcome. last time too on your winter uh, majestic winters in national parks. That was a great presentation as well. 
Um, if you happen to miss this presentation or any of the others, we are recording these and posting them to our YouTube page, usually about two to three days after the fact. Um, you're welcome to find them here on the OutdoorAdventureExpo.com site or on our YouTube page. Um, so yeah, feel free to check us out. And uh, as always, definitely send us some suggestions on any presentations or clinics that uh, you may want to hear about. So thanks, Jonathan. Have a great night. And again, uh, appreciate your time and collaboration and have a safe and wonderful holiday season, okay? All right. Thanks, Don. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, bye now.